Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all of you who are connecting to our debate on rebuilding Europe through digital transformation. Today, we expect uh, uh, around 70 participants, including MEPs, members of our forum, and representatives of EU institutions. As some of you may remember, this is not the first time that we covered this topic at our forum. We have hosted a first debate on the same topic three months ago. At the beginning of July, with our co-chairs, Pilar del Castillo and Ivan Stefanek, who you know, who are both leading MEPs in digital policy. We have exchanged views with the European Commission, with the telco and the tech industry on the role of digital in the reaction to the pandemic and in uh, Europe's recovery. The bottom line was never let a, cri a crisis go to waste. But of course, back then, we didn't know as much about the next generation EU funds. Well, now we know that 20% of the recovery plan will be invested uh, in digital transformation, which is extraordinary. The question now is how to get it right. And today we will ask this question to a very special guest, Vittorio Colau. Benvenuto, Vittorio. Vittorio is not only an Italian businessman who has been Vodafone CEO for 10 years until uh, 2018, now working with General Atlantic, Unilever, Bocconi University, and Verizon, among other things. He has also played an essential role during the pandemic in Italy, which was the first European country hit by the coronavirus. Last May, Vittorio was appointed by the Italian government as lead of the task force to guide Italy through the phase two of the crisis. With a group of experts, he has worked on a memorandum, also known as the Colau Plan, to provide guidance to Italy's reopening after the lockdown. We are, of course, very excited to hear from him today about his experience and how he sees the future. But before I give the floor to our co-chairs, Pilar del Castillo, uh, first, and then Ivan Stefanek, and then, uh, of course, to our, to our guest of honor, Vittorio Colau. Let me remind you of our house rules, as usual, to make sure that you can actively participate from the audience as well. All attendees are now mute. There will be a Q&A session after the speeches, and you'll be most welcome to take the floor. To do so, please use the raise hand function on the web chat. It's usually under the participants tab. And for your information, this debate is being recorded, but the Q&A session won't be disclosed and will be under Chatham House rule as always. We're now ready to start. Pilar, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, dear colleagues and EIF members. Uh, my words uh, is not going to be a reflection on any uh, recovery, any rebuilding. It's going to be uh, more uh, on the personality and uh, the role that uh, now, but uh, previously, um, uh, uh, Vittorio Colau has played, um, and this is very important to understand, uh, you know, his uh, position also in this special committee, this special uh, tax force is now. His experience uh, and uh, knowledge is unquestionable. It was during uh, Colau's leadership as CEO of Vodafone when the company underwent a deep transformation of its business model, becoming leader in the provision of innovative services and consolidating its position as the most pan-European electronic communications uh, provider. Uh, from a personal perspective, I fondly uh, recall a number of exchange of views uh, that we have, sometimes really very unique such as uh, during the adoption process of the telecom single market, when Parliament decided to eliminate roaming charges. Uh, as you are uh, very well aware, and Maria Rosa mentioned, in April, uh, Vittorio Colau was appointed chair of the special task force for the Italian recovery plan by uh, Minister Giuseppe Conte. In my view, the choice would not have been wiser. Uh, Vittorio combines uh, knowledge, experience, vision, uh, and clarity, uh, not to mention his sense of humor. The Vittorio, the EIF is really honored uh, to have you here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We are uh, really looking forward uh, to what you have to say. And now the floor is entirely yours. 
Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. I would like first, mindful of the fact that there's been a change in agenda uh, for Ivan Stefane, I would like to give the floor to him okay, because okay, he will sorry, have to go. Yes, yes. yes, it's a last minute change. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, there will be yeah. an extraordinary IMCO committee meeting. So Ivan informed mm -hmm. us that he will have to leave uh, yes, earlier than expected. Okay, okay. So very briefly, over to Ivan and then of course, uh, we'll be listening to, to Victoria with great pleasure. Thank you very much, Maria Rosa. Thank you very much, Pilar. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, really very happy to be with you this morning and to talk about digital transformation, because from my point of view, it is really the, the key which will determine success or not success for our future. We have uh, really quite a lot of money. We talk about the recovery package, about new, new generation Europe. So I'm uh, very happy that we have such uh, experienced speaker as uh, Mr. Colau. Uh, but I'd like to mention three points at the beginning. First one is that uh, I think we have to talk, if we talk about digital transformation, we have to talk about infrastructure, internal infrastructure. Uh, without uh, improvement of digital infrastructure, I think we cannot achieve our specific targets. And uh, we talk not only about accessibility of uh, internet, about connectivity, but also about um, infrastructure and suitable equipment for teachers, students. So we have to have uh, really hardware in um, uh, for everybody will contribute to our digital transformation. Second point is that um, uh, we have to talk about digital skills, about the contents, because uh, talking about digital transformation, we should um, also take into consideration that uh, every job in near future will uh, also need to be covered by digital skills and this is something what we can uh, also contribute mm -hmm. from european perspective third my point is uh, that uh, we have to have a specific uh, digital plan for digital uh, transformation we have quite specific plan for green transformation and but we know that without uh, digital support we cannot achieve green transformation but also uh, I would be very happy if we can have from European Commission some kind of uh, achievable specific targets, uh, not only for 2050, but also for 2025, 2030. So this is something what we can talk about also with our digital community. And I think if we have specific targets in place uh, for European Union, for the countries as well, it can uh, achieve our goals for uh digital transformation so thank you very much i'm looking forward to our discussion today thank you ivan for sharing your your remarks uh, and uh, over to uh, vittorio please uh thank you very much uh good morning everybody thank you ivan and pilar i have to say uh, that there are three reasons why i'm here this morning one is because as you all know, I'm deeply pro-Europe and I always, uh, I have to say, not like many CEOs, I always had a lot of respect for the European Parliament itself and the role that it plays, despite all the negative criticism out of Brexit and the UK and so on. I'm a great believer in what you guys do. Uh, secondly, it's because of digital and this is, you know, my life, my field. And third, it's because of Pilar, because uh, I remember our many meetings in Brussels, not always agreeing, sometimes agreeing, sometimes not. But, you know, it's part of my uh, fond memory. So thank you so much, Pilar, not just for your hard work, but also for inviting me today. What I would like to do uh, today uh, is really to speak for maybe 20 minutes and cover basically two things. The Italian work, uh, but not too much, not too much in detail, because for reasons that I will say uh, that uh, uh, it's already evolving. Second, link it to the moment of Europe and why digital, I think, is just not a plan for Europe or has to be the core strategy for Europe, but for the political Europe, for the social Europe, for the you know, for the unity of, uh, of the block, and then indicate, uh, as Ivan was asking, few practical things that uh, uh, I would recommend uh, uh, Parliament consider. So, to start with the Commission, my Commission was an advisory Commission, was not a decision-making body, so the job was to help uh, unlock uh, 
the country first, which we did in the first uh, three weeks, and then go to the uh, to the plan, to the recommendation plan. And uh, the recommendation plan was really, uh, uh, if you want, based uh, on uh, three axes. And the three axes were surprise, surprise. This was before next generation plan was beginning of June, digitalization, green revolution, and equality inclusion. Why? Well, because Italy, even more than Europe, actually, after the pandemic, given the situation, uh, needs resilience, needs to be more competitive, and needs more fairness, inclusion, and equality. So I would say it was my, our recommendations were very Italian-focused recommendation, but guess what? They have been in the end, uh, very, very consistent with uh, the European one, because Italy might have more acute problems or better opportunities, but at the end of the day reflects the broader European situation. What we recommended was really organized in six areas, and some of them are more specific than it for Italy. Some of them apply to the whole of Europe, but at the end of the day, they are, I mean, there's, I read the French plan, the France Relance, I read the German one, I mean, you're not talking about something dramatically different, you know, across all these plans. Uh, ours was organized in six areas. The first one uh, is clearly uh, competitiveness and support to enterprise and labor. The second was infrastructure. And when I say infrastructure, all types of infrastructure, the green infrastructures, the digital infrastructures, the water and the green infrastructures, the uh, mobility infrastructure, which is super important. Tourism, art and culture, because of the country, because that's the icon of the country. Something that uh, is super important, I think, everywhere, which is public administration and the digitization of public administration. And not just because this means better service and lower cost, but also because this means a better relationship with the citizens and uh, the unity of the state, public and private, actually can really happen to, to our, uh, through a public administration, which is very efficient. And then uh, uh, a chapter on uh, university and research, and I will say a few words about research because Ivan said something very important uh, in his introduction. And then the final, the social measures for inclusions. Now, we had 102 proposals last night uh, after uh, talking to Pilar, I counted how many of these proposals can be called digital in a way or another. And the number is more than 20, it's like 21, 22. And uh, honestly, uh, they cover what you would uh, expect in any country to be covered. So they cover uh, networks, uh, fiber, 5G uh, deployment. Um, they include uh, IP protection, so the protection of digital IP and therefore uh, measures to help startups. Uh, electronic payments, uh, so the cashless, frictionless uh, society. Uh, they cover e-procurement and uh, digital public administration. Super important, two topics that uh, I will say then why Europe should look more at. One, the use for of data for research purposes uh, and, uh, and the availability of data for scientists and for policymakers to make better and faster progress in their thinking. Uh, and I, I will come back to this. Uh, cyber defense and cyber security, which is a topic that periodically comes back, gets debated, but doesn't really get translated into uh, actions. And most importantly, ICT competencies. And ICT competencies is important because uh, uh, if we think about uh, uh, what Ivan was talking about, the need for innovation, the need for, you know, uh, all this uh, kind of modern development of both business and uh, uh, the society. You, uh, the way you can think is a little bit uh, uh, like this. Uh, you know, social and business innovation is like a vehicle, is a car. The car needs the roads and the roads are, of course, the networks and uh, the infrastructure. Then the car needs the wheels, and the wheels are the platforms, what uh, uh, you know, America has been super good at and Europe a little bit less good at in developing. But then you need the fuel, 
and the fuel is the brain uh, of the people, is uh, the competencies, is the intellectual property, is the ability to develop on those platforms for those roles what is needed. And uh, what we recommended for Italy, I think, also uh, applies uh, to Europe. There is a strong need to coordinate much more the big research missions. The big uh, Europe is good at doing this. The countries are a little bit less good at taking advantage. The member states are less good at taking advantage of it. But uh, COVID has given an acceleration. So what is happening now in medical research can happen in other areas where finally there is a much stronger sharing of uh, joint uh, research. Let's face it, we need to give incentives to the researchers. We need to have a better applied PhDs path for our students. We need to give fiscal or personal incentives for early career uh, PhDs and researchers because we are in a world which I'll describe in a few words. These people will really be the fuel of our innovation. Uh, a lot of other people will be necessary. People talk a lot about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the great uh, digital connected society, but you need innovation to fuel this. Otherwise, there could be a digital innovative society which depends on other platforms or other people uh, to work. And so these were, if you want, uh, our proposals. I would say when the next gen come, uh, plan came out, we were very happy because, you know, basically the chapters were essentially the same. And, uh, and now the state is where the government is developing the real plan. They're taking a lot of inputs, including ours. And, you know, they're very kind in saying that they're using a lot of what we recommend uh, even last week to have said again in, uh, in, uh, in the big plans. But of course, that's, you know, the government's prerogative to include whatever they need to include. Let me now move to uh, how I see Europe uh, and why digital and everything we recommended or more things than what we recommended is crucial. I would say that there are three big, big reasons why I welcome uh, uh, digital transformation that you are I, I welcome the fact that you are proposing it to be the core of what Europe discusses, but I think it's not just about transformation. If I'm honest, I think it's about the nature of Europe. And I, I would say it in uh, three different ways. The first is, let's say, the reactive and the defensive uh, reason. I mean, COVID has created a lot of problems and it has created a lot of problems in a Europe which was already growing less than the other parts of the world which has an older population with more social services. So in a way, the impact of COVID here could be uh, softened in the short term, but could be longer than in other parts of the world. Other parts of the world, two years from now, three years from now, might react better. Uh, let's face it, COVID has hit uh, a lot of uh, regions, uh, a lot of sectors like tourism and uh, art and mobility and uh, uh, retail and transportation, which in Europe are very, very essential. Uh, COVID clearly has uh, uh, a, an impact uh, on productivity. Uh, it's unclear whether it is as positive as people were thinking. So now there's people who are saying mm, maybe it's not that positive. Europe was not at the top, top of the productivity gain. So in a way, we need to put uh, digital at the center of the recovery from uh, uh, the COVID uh, uh, crisis. And of course, it will help because of course, it's uh, Europe is small, it's very connected. If we travel less, but we can communicate better and more, and we have more trade on a digital level and we use our assets, tourism and uh, and, uh, and art and culture in a better way, and we link our universe in a better way through digital, the reaction to COVID will be, will be better. So for sure, for the EU, uh, this is a must to recover from the problems. But let me give you two more reasons why I think the debate of today is important. The first one is the general state of the world. And here I'm talking about, you know, something in between technology and geopolitics. But, you know, it's part uh, of the debate. The world is very quickly kind of polarizing, as we know very well, between US uh, uh, and China into two 
potentially very separate uh, technology worlds. And it started with Huawei and uh, Huawei we cannot trust uh, and the Americans who were putting pressures on the Europeans to not take uh, Huawei network because of geopolitical concerns. Then it moved to TikTok. You see in these days the debate on TikTok here. It's not really spying, it's much more influence, it's much more where is the data of Europeans going. But it's interesting, if you read on the Financial Times, there were a couple of articles in the last uh, week. Uh, it is also really about the residence of data and how data should be used or could be used to influence the political thinking or the social thinking of populations. Then it is quickly moving into AI and uh, uh, training algorithm. And I'm not criticizing this polarization. I just think it's a fact of life. You have a very large country. China with a huge population, you have a, a technology which improves with vast amounts of data and with the ability of training algorithm and developing solutions on that. Well, if you see that as a competitor, of course, you don't want to help uh, them too much. But then I also see, on the other hand, that the wheels, the so-called platforms, actually, they tend to be most of them American and therefore I understand fully, and this is not a, a, an American administration point, I understand fully that protecting the strength of those wheels, of those platforms, is also uh, a priority for whatever administration. So it's not a Trump thing. Uh, there might be some Trump color in it, but it is a, a priority, and it will be a priority. This is not going to change. This is going to be the, the name of the game. There's a mass enormous country with a lot of data which will have an intrinsic advantage in developing digital and there is another country which has already developed the wheels and wants to preserve its own uh, strength there and uh, if you look at uh, uh, Europe uh, and you think will we matter in this debate uh, to some extent it's obvious that it's uh, uh, in the interest of both of these parties to say no Europe should not matter should decide where to go one side or the other choose with me or against me and uh, you know you know let's our own uh, let me call it digital presence in the world and how can we reasonably structure that reasonable uh, the, the digital presence in the interest of our businesses in the interest of our citizens, not against anybody else, because this is not about, you know, you know being a, against somebody else, but in such a way that this could be the basis for that innovation car to really go as fast as possible, as independently as possible on the beautiful networks that I'm sure we will, uh, uh, we will build. So I think Europe needs to take a stance on this digital kind of strategy, not just because we recover from COVID, not just because you know it's a better way of living and a cheaper way of living and you know you have digital health and you know uh, digital payments and we are all frictionless and all the buzzwords that you know we use in our industry. also because the position on digital policies will define a little bit who we are uh, in the world as uh, uh, as europeans so I gave you a defensive reason, I gave you a context reason, now there is uh, the positive reasons of what we should do. Now, positive reasons for putting digital at the center of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the whole work of the Parliament and the Commission. First, uh, helping our industrial sectors. We have a wonderful industrial sector. I observe from the point of view of Verizon, from the point of view of Vodafone, the European industrial sector has already moved, uh, is more advanced, for example, in IoT, is uh, very advanced in looking at uh, factory automation. If you think about factory automation and IoTs as you know, two important pillars of what our industries will be, it's obvious that we need to do everything to allow 5G and fiber to be as per pervasive as possible. And it's a strength of Europe because we have many, not just giant companies, but also small, medium companies. And again, being Italian, being exposed to Italy now a little bit more than in the past, I can guarantee to you that there are amazing companies, but also in Spain, that are really starting to build there. With my work of General Atlantic, I'm seeing 
unicorns that you guys don't know that they exist, but they are in Germany, they are in Spain, they start becoming real companies. We need to strengthen the infrastructure on which these companies uh, will work. We need to help traditional companies modernize. So having this as a priority requires uh, uh, simplification of uh, uh, the current regulatory regime, allowing networks to be deployed, but also helping the industrial sector with you know, the type of incentives that, for example, we have put in our plan, uh, in our recommendation to the Italian governments, introduce these technologies, amortize this technology more quickly, get some kind of fiscal incentive to uh, move ahead. The second clearly is uh, uh, what I described the data, uh, the data sovereignty. I was so pleased when yesterday I read on the Financial Times, which is printed in England, as you know, and England is uh, uh, Brexit, the Brexit uh, country, that uh, the alternative between the uh, American and the Chinese model is the GDPR model. Uh, we have a framework for data in Europe, which might be complicated. It might have to be simplified a bit, but at the end of the day has been as the true framework, which is friendly to the companies and friendly to the individuals. Not too friendly, a bit bureaucratic sometimes, but at the end of the day, that's a strength. Now, we need to leverage on that much more and be sure that research, as I said, development of innovation and sharing of data within the European countries is actually as frictionless as possible because we can build the strength of our digital players if we use that. And at the same time, we are creating the third, uh, if you want, block, digital block in the world, China, US and Europe. Europe, of course, closer to the US, but with our own, uh, uh, with our own uh, uh, rule. The opposite risk is balkanization. I, if you ask me what, uh, if I were you know, one of the two other blocks, I would love Europe to balkanize. I would like, love each country to design their own rules because then I know that you know, everything will end up in one of the two uh, systems. Uh, of course, uh, we need to think about consumers. Third, the third area, it's still a great opportunity to give scale to these companies. What really makes my heart bleed is when I meet these companies, wonderful companies, young companies, entrepreneur can be Portuguese, can I, there is one, this is a real example, Portuguese, Spanish or German. They had wonderful ideas, sometimes as students. They build companies which are worth now more than a billion, so they're unicorn, and they say, oh, my real market is the US. Uh, if I don't go to the US, I will never get quickly big scale. And you ask, okay, why not Europe? And the answer is because there is not a single digital Europe. There is, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, so many different countries. If I go into the US, I hit big, I win. If I have to do it in Europe, it's difficult. Now, I sorry here, Pilar, you and I discussed so many times this, from the times of Commissioner Oettinger, from the, we, this is the single thing that makes me more frustrated. We have been talking about single digital market for so long, but it is still halfway through. And we need to push, we need to make it sure that for consumers, this becomes really a single digital market. So that my Portuguese, Spanish or German entrepreneurs, they really say, I don't need necessarily to go to the US. I might want to go to the US. I also have an alternative. And then fourth and last, and you would be surprised uh, by hearing this, actually, we need to preserve the spirit of good open competition that uh, uh, Europe has always defending in a balanced way, not in an excessive way. But I have to say that uh, I think the work that the uh, competition uh, uh, commissioner is doing uh, is important. Uh, it has to be directed in the right way, but we need to be sure that we preserve internal fair competition within Europe, just because it is what we have been good at. And we are sure that there is no unfair advantage for players uh, based outside of Europe. And here, I have to say it, I am full of respect for uh, a lot of the big tech giants, especially the American ones. But the reality is that there is a tax uh, disadvantage for, or, or a tax advantage in their favor. The reality is that despite the efforts of Commissioner Vestager, who I think has tried to do the right thing, 
we are still struggling with a fair and balanced play. Now, this is not nationalism, but I would say if the world has two blocks and the two blocks become very strong in protecting their own companies, uh, I'm sorry, but I would be a European nationalist. I would not be a German nationalist or an Italian nationalist, but I would say maybe it's time to start saying, hey, you want to play in Europe, you have to follow the European rules. Otherwise, we are going to do something to rebalance the level playing field that is not here today. So uh, just to open to, to conclude and to open to, question, to questions, I think in a way, uh, the digital, as I said, is a wonderful opportunity to react to COVID, to increase the resilience and increase the competitiveness of Italy in the case of my commission, but I would say Europe in the case of your job. But it's more than that. Digital is a great opportunity to define a bigger role for the future, for the EU, for the EU, because unfortunately, Britain will not be part of that anymore, in the context of the world where digital is becoming the defining element of any geopolitical strategy. And it's also a great opportunity to help our next generations. And it's also a great opportunity to create jobs, to help our smaller companies become unicorns, to help our citizens have a frictionless, better life but also to help uh, the development of, you know, the competencies and the academic uh, innovation that we all know will be uh, necessary in the future and cannot really rely on any single uh, country uh, for its development. So I would say a defensive reason or a reactive reason, a, a strategic reason, and also a little bit of an ethical and uh, generational reasons to put digital at the center of uh, uh, European policies and uh, to use this opportunity of the big funds to spend uh, the money into the directions that I indicated and make uh, and make this happen in the next, uh, let's say, five years. That's my introduction, Pilar. Back to Maria Rosa and you.